I'm, I'm going to share a little tidbit, if that's okay, for about 10 minutes on, on friendship evangelism. And then I'll share another tidbit a little bit later, looking at friendship evangelism. And then we're going to focus on how to give Christ-centered dynamic Bible studies. This presentation is highly practical. So what it's going to do is open up questions, I hope, in your mind. And we're going to have a question and answer period um, after this presentation. So that is my goals for this. And what Christina did not tell you is that she spends her life chasing children. Life is so busy. Those of your mothers know exactly what that means. But um, I, am, I come home and I, I see them for a couple hours at night and a totally different experience as a father than it is as a mother. And so, uh, you know, I read somewhere, I think it's in a, uh, some lady named Ellen White said something like this, that the, the work of a mother is higher than that of a king on his throne. And uh, there's nothing more important than the work of a mother. So uh, I just praise God for my wife and the ministry she does. Um, I get to go out and preach, but she has to live. And that's a totally harder <laughs> experience. All right. Have we had prayer yet? Do you mind if we pray as we get started? Father in heaven, as we come together here this afternoon, we just pray for your spirit's presence. We're going to be looking at very practical things and how to share uh, the love you've given us with other people. We pray that you will be with us. We ask in your name, amen. You don't mind me not wearing the suit jacket? I feel a whole lot better. I'd like to just share some basic information on friendship evangelism. And one of them, I, I don't have it on my slide, so I'll just give it to you. It's an acronym. How to start a conversation. Have you ever wondered how to start a conversation with someone? I used to wonder how to start a conversation with people. This was a, a difficult thing for me to do. I am naturally very shy. Um, I don't act shy, um, but I am quite shy. I remember when I was in high school, I would say hi to people as they walked by me in the hallway, and I said it so softly that most of the time they never heard me. So I just grew up thinking that people didn't like me. And then I realized I have to talk louder and be a little bit more aggressive. But um, how to make friends and how to have a conversation. There is an acronym that we use at AFCO that is very helpful. It's called FORT, F-O-R-T, FORT. It is this, family, occupation, religion, and testimony. Family, occupation, religion, and testimony. So when you meet someone, the first thing you could talk about is, if you have nothing to talk about, you can ask them about them, their family. Um, and that includes anything like, where are you from? Um, how long have you been here? If someone comes up um, and asks, uh, some, I would ask someone, I was sharing with someone here, so is this your home church? No, it's not my home church. Okay, where are you from? This is a way to start a conversation. Ask about them personally. Uh, Ladies, probably a little bit easier to ask about the family. And gentlemen, and, and those who are actually, not just gentlemen, but whoever's working full-time, guys typically like talking about their job more than they like talking about their family. I'm not sure why that is. But guys like talking about their job more. It's maybe more of a, their identification. Ask them about their job. What do they like doing? Um, there are times I've had conversations with guys. I never learned their name. I know nothing about their family, but we talk for two hours. Whereas uh, I think it would never work that way with my wife. She would know their name and their family and everything like that. It may not know what they do. So there's uh, differences. But family and occupation, very good things. You don't want to ask people, when uh, do you go to church? That that's a, actually comes across as offensive. Because if they say no, they feel like, OK, that's the end of the conversation. Um, so what we often ask is, do you have a chance to go to church much? And people say, no, I don't. You say, oh, okay, you must be pretty busy with life, et cetera, et cetera. And you can continue the conversation instead of having a conversation stopper. Uh, you want to be able to do that. And then if you get through and you find out that they're a fellow Christian, you can share your testimony. That's T. You can share your testimony. Short testimony, three minutes long. How many continue to share their testimony in three minutes? You can. One minute of what your life was before you met Jesus. One minute how you met Jesus, and one minute what your life's been like since you met Jesus. Very simple. You don't have to write war and peace. You don't have to have something long. Okay, just a simple explanation of how you came to meet Jesus. Um, typically, if we were doing 
Uh, if you came to AFCO, you would actually have to write out your testimony and share it. We won't do that, but I strongly suggest that you do that in your personal time. If you've never written out your testimony in short form, write it out. It's simple. Three paragraphs of five to six sentences apiece. Here's what I was before I met Jesus. Here's what my life is. Uh, here's how I met him, and here's what my life is since I've met him. Um, yeah. Fort. F stands for family. O stands for occupation. R stands for religion. And T stands for... And when you're asking about religion, what question do you not ask them? Do you go to church? Well, you can ask them, do you have an opportunity to go to church? Or as my pastor friend said, if you're a person who likes humor, you could say, what church are you what do you typically try to avoid? And uh, start a good conversation that way. So that's a little tidbit on how to start conversations. I have found that um, those conversations are going to go as long or as short as you want them to go. So use that in your evangelism. I'll share another one at the beginning of our next one. How many of you have ever given a Bible study before? I'm not, actually, I shouldn't ask you that. You might, may not want to raise your hand or otherwise. But I remember, I was a teacher, and I can teach students in a classroom all day long. But give a Bible study? Whoa, that's just scary. I was scared of giving Bible studies. The idea of giving a Bible study to someone who, are, who may not want it, because that's always how I thought about it, made me nervous. So I went to a school in 2008 called AFCO. I'm a graduate of the four-month program at AFCO. We went there, and they taught us how to do Bible studies, how to give Bible studies. And we did it the hard way. You want to know the hard way is? The hard way is going out on the streets and knocking on the doors, trying to find people who may be interested. I remember one day we knocked on 200 doors. It was hot, and Sacramento is hot. Um, thankfully, it's not humid like it is here in Singapore, but it's very hot. We would have 100 degrees with about 40 degrees Celsius. Um, we were out with our blue shirts, our pants on. We couldn't wear shorts, knocking on doors. I remember I was getting very discouraged. Someone let us into their house and said, okay, uh, we talked to them for half an hour. After half an hour, you know what they said? We're not interested. So we went to another door, and they let us in. And we were in the air conditioning, enjoying the air conditioning for about a half an hour, and they said, we're not interested. And I was getting really discouraged at that point. I thought, let me just quit. It's been a long day anyhow. Let me just leave. And uh, my outreach partner and I said, let's do a little bit more. So we did a, a one or two more doors. And I remember this door because it was, it was a good door. I remember knocking. You don't remember the bad doors. You only remember the good doors. I remember knocking and hearing this dog barking. And the lady opens up the door and she's holding on to the dog with one hand. The dog's lunging for the crack of the door. Now, I stood there. It was my turn to talk. So I said, hi, my name is Chuck, and this is my friend. And he was gone. He wasn't there. He was scared of dogs. And he was down on the sidewalk. So I continued and gave the survey. And the whole way through this, we asked a little survey. Uh, you know, I'm with the Amazing Facts and Media Ministry, and we're just going to see what the needs are in the community. So we just have a very quick survey to see what programs you might be interested in your community. And so we would check. Uh, would you be interested in any health programs such as cooking schools or uh, reversing diabetes seminars? Yes, okay. Would you be interested in parenting seminars? No. Would you be interested in, so I would just check that. And at the end, it says we also check on spiritual health and see if anyone's interested in group Bible studies. Would you be interested in group Bible No. I individual Bible studies, yes. Yes? I wasn't expecting that. I had gotten 200 no's so far, or, or blank doors. And she said yes. And I said, okay, um, what's a good time? Maybe next week at this time? She goes, sure. I remember just that shock. We went back to her house that next week. We sat down in her, in her living room, and we opened up the Bible to Daniel. And we started studying the book of Daniel. Daniel 1 is where we started. And her husband walked in. What are you all doing here? No. We're doing a Bible study on Daniel. Why are you studying Daniel? You should be studying the life of Jesus. Right? What do you say? I can tell you what I did. I prayed. And I said, sir, 
Can I share with you a passage from Jesus' writings himself? It's in Matthew chapter 24. He said, sure. I turned to Matthew 24, 15, and I read this. That which is spoken of by Daniel the prophet, he who reads, let him understand. He said, he said that? Let me see that. He says, right here. <laughs> no way. He said, so Jesus said to study Daniel. I said, kind of. He said, okay. Can I study with you? I said, absolutely. So we went and we studied, and he and his wife ended up accepting the Sabbath, ended up coming to a program, a seminar, very similar to a, a typical evangelism program. Exciting to see that. And I found out that Bible studies can be fun, but there is a way to do it that's right. Now, I used to think that Bible studies is I go to your house and I open up my Bible and you open up your Bible and I say, okay, you read this one and I'll read this one and you read this one and I'll read this one. And we read like this, dot, 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 dot. Yeah, dot, 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 dot. Have you ever seen Bible studies like that? Maybe you did one like that. I've done one like that. But there is a way to give Bible studies that is Christ-centered, that's vibrant, that's alive. And I learned that at AFCO. And I'd like to share with you what I learned as a student. Something I think that's been one of the most helpful things uh, in my ministry. Because not only is it for Bible studies, it's good for writing sermons or doing Sabbath school classes or any kind of presentation. So we're going to look at this. Let's just, uh, I'm going to start with a statistic from a book called Winsome Witnessing by a man named Gary Gibbs. If you don't have the book Winsome Witnessing by Gary Gibbs, I suggest you find a copy. He is an incredible uh, writer on personal evangelism and how to share with your friends and neighbors. In this book, he asks a question. If you have an evangelist, uh, let's say you have a successful evangelist, how many baptisms do you think you would have a, a, a year? A successful evangelist. And I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek a little bit because it's not him who has the baptisms. It's Christ who gives the baptism. Let's just say, how many baptisms would be connected with his ministry per year? Anyone want to give me a number? 10? 100? 1,000 a year? Would well, you think 1,000 a year is a big number, right? Let's just say it's 1,000 a day. Do you think that's possible? It's not, but let's pretend it is. 1,000 a day. So we have a successful evangelist. Through his ministry, 1,000 people a day come to Jesus Christ. Now you have a church member who shares by themselves with one person and they have Bible studies and they make friends and they become friends and they start sharing with each other and that person comes to know Jesus and it's one person a year. And then the two of them get together and they each find someone they share with and there's four the next year. Which way is most effective? You know the answer, that's why you're not answering, right? It is the evangelist trying to get you to talk. I apologize. I'm a teacher. Let's look at it. Here's how it would work. Here, uh, after year one, there's 365,000 with the gifted evangelists, and there's two people for the other method. After year two, is 730,000 and four. By year eight, you're looking at almost 3 million versus 256. At this point, it looks very obvious that the gifted evangelist is just God just wants to use gifted evangelists. But then something changes. After, at year 23, you have 8,395,000 with a gifted evangelist doing 10, 1,000 a day. That's an incredible rate. With a church member winning one person per year, it's 8,388,000, almost the same. Each person reaching one person. You know, there's a... a it was put out by the General Conference in 2015, and the concept is this. Every member reaches one person. Do you realize that if every single member reached one person in the next three years, four years before the next GC session? I know that makes, it's easy math, but we'd have double the amount of people we have now, actually more than that, because our children also are being born and raised and baptized. It'd be amazing. After 24 years, of course, the numbers just get dramatically different. And you say, well, Chuck, this is just a play with math. Is it really? It is. It helps to explain a point, though, doesn't it? Next year, I say Singapore, you know, right now, this weekend, there is two evangelism training programs taking place in Singapore. That's amazing. Can you imagine that each one of us, at both this program and the other program, went out and won one person this next year? 
That means next year at this time when there's evangelism training again, it'd be double the amount of people. Three years from now, it'd be four times the amount of people. It's amazing. And it's not hard. Can one person reach one person a year? Yes. It's possible. Very possible. And we're going to look at one way, and that is through sharing the Word of God. Before I go any further, I'm going to give you an appeal. Now, you're supposed to save your appeals as a speaker till the very end. I'm going to do it backwards. I'm going to give you the appeal right now and ask you not to make a decision on it, but to save that appeal in your mind to an hour from now. Here's the appeal. How many of you are willing to say, please don't raise your hand, this is just preparation, that you are willing to pray every day for the next two months that God will bring you to someone who wants to study the Bible? I'm not saying you're searching. I'm not saying you're going out there and beating the bushes. I'm saying you're willing to pray for the next two months every day, God, help me to be open to whoever you're leading to me. Help me to see whoever it is is searching. That'll be the appeal. Okay, let's go through. Alonzo J. Warner in his book, The Art of Personal Evangelism, says this. You cannot reach a thousand until you reach one. One person at a time. Is that the way Jesus ministered? Absolutely. Some of the most important teachings he gave were to individual people. John chapter 3, John chapter 4, John chapter 5. There are some ABCs of giving Bible studies, and I like to look through these ABCs. When you're giving a Bible study, Jesus should be the center of what you're presenting. Present him first. In fact, the very first and most important thing is to melt and subdue the soul by presenting our Lord Jesus Christ as the sin bearer, the sin pardoning Savior, making the gospel as clear as possible. And Desire of Ages 826 says, the wonderful love of Christ will melt and subdue hearts when the mere re reiteration of doctrines would accomplish nothing. Your most important thing is not to give hard facts. The most important thing, the first thing, is to present Jesus Christ. When you're doing evangelism, that is the most important thing. Number two, reveal truth gradually. These are ABCs. There's three of them. First one, present Jesus first. Number two, reveal truth gradually. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more into the perfect day. When I was a child, my dad was a, uh, my dad's a hardworking man, wakes up early, he would leave the house to work before I woke up, and he'd get home after I went to sleep. That's the way my childhood was with my dad. And on Sundays, he would wake me up, because he would be home on the weekend. On Sunday, he would wake me up, come into my room, say, son, time for you to wake up. And I remember, the first thing you do is turn my light on. And when someone turns the light on in your room and you're sleeping, what do you do? I know what I did. I covered my head, right? And then my dad would take his hand. My dad, he's a, he runs a log truck. And he works outside, so his hands are very, very rough. They're like sandpaper. He would take his hand, and he'd slide them underneath the cover, and he'd go like this. Rub really hard in my stomach until I was screaming, stop! And I'd curl up in a ball, and my dad would just laugh. And then he'd walk out of the bedroom, because he knew there's no way I'm going back to sleep after that. Sometimes we do that with those who are friends, and it comes to religion. We give them all the light we can. We take our hands, we rub their stomach and say, here it is, here it is, take it. And they're like, no, no, stay away from me. Our goal is to reveal light gradually. You don't turn on the light. It's kind of like walking out of a dark cave. And as you walk out slowly, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. That's how we want to share truth, gradually and slowly. Um, letter C. The third point here, and that is make regular appeals. Every Bible study, make an appeal. I'm not asking to say, like, make an appeal, like, will you follow Jesus? Because you're going to assume, probably after you made that appeal, that they're going to continue following Jesus. But you're going to make different appeals. Appeals for them to accept the truth that you're sharing in that Bible study. Let's say you're talking about the second coming. Here's your appeal. It could be, would you, be, would you like to be ready for Jesus' second coming? That's an appeal. Maybe you're covering about the uh, state of the dead. Would you like to pray that you and your loved ones be part of that, that, that uh, first resurrection? Amen. These are all things that you can come and appeal to in, in a seminar, in a, <laughs> in a Bible study. At the close of every meeting, and I'm adding here Bible study, decisions should be called for. Always ask for decisions. Okay. 
Evangelism, page 333. Christina said this when she was up here, but there is no greater bliss on this side of heaven than in winning souls to Christ. When you see a person make a decision for Christ, and I mean truly make a decision, when you see someone whose life has been turned from here to here, I have a friend of mine who's gone from a life of crime to a life of complete surrender and service for God. Do you know how joyful that is to see that? When you, you see someone whose life has been unhappy and they've been miserable and they've given their life to Christ and they're a different person, that is awesome. Maybe you can remember what God did to you. That is beautiful and that's what God, uh, there's no greater bliss than that. Here are some basics, a time outline of a Bible study. In a Bible study, here's how you would break up the time at a Bible study. You're going to spend roughly an hour at their house. The first 8 to 10 minutes will be social time. The next 30 to 45 minutes is study time. And then you would spend 3 to 5 minutes giving an appeal and a decision. So this is, uh, you have a silent prayer partner. I would strongly suggest that you go out two by two. Going out by one is uh, not as effective. Uh, the gospel method is going out two by two. That's what Jesus did, and I think that's, uh, he had his uh, disciples do. And then, don't stay longer than one hour, especially in today's society. You know, if someone spends longer than an hour, you start thinking, oh boy, they're taking up a lot of my time. Next week, they're going to be taking, the same, taking up the same amount of time. I don't know what it's like in Singapore, but in North America, we find out that 95% uh, of the time, if you spend longer than an hour, they're not going to want you to come back next week because they're going to think that you're going to take a lot of their time. Um, however, when I was in Greece, it was not that way. It was completely opposite. They had their little group Bible studies. I shared this with you last night. When we did our group Bible studies, they were four hours long. Every week, four hours long. And we did everything wrong, according to Western standards. We had, we sat down and had hors d'oeuvres and talked and relaxed. We had social time for an hour. Then we ate a meal together for about an hour. And then we studied the Bible for about an hour and a half. And then we spent a half an hour talking and socializing again before we leave. But what I'm about to share with you is what works most of the time in a more Western culture. With that in mind, let's continue. What do you do in social time? Well, use fort. What's fort? Family, occupation, religion, testimony. Um, recognize things of interest. What is... Um, if you're a person's house and you see that they have, I like horses, and if I see they have pictures of horses, I'll say, wow, so um, what horse is this? And I can ask them questions about what they have. Find something that's interesting. Even if you don't like it, ask them about it and, and pay attention to what they may be interested in. Be a good listener. Have good body language. Respect their personal space. Have good eye contact, voice, and expression. When <laughs> don't stare a person down, but have good eye contact. Because eye contact says that you're paying attention to somebody. Um, personal space is different for different people. Um, I like having a little bit of personal space. And I need about that much. So four feet, three feet is good. If I find a person who likes to talk and they put their face this close to me, I get uncomfortable. And so you want to recognize what is your personal space and respect the personal space of someone else. Good, um, <laughs> good body language. I did so bad on body language when I first started giving Bible studies or visiting in a home. I tried to be comfortable because I thought that people would be more relaxed if you're comfortable. So I would sit down like this on their couch and I'd go like this. Oh, so how are you doing? Yeah, good. But that's, you, you know that's not really the best way. It's ideal more to sit on the edge of your seat, not uncomfortable and stiff as a board, but relax. But because you're sitting on the edge and you're leaning forward, it shows that you're what? You're interested. You're paying attention. So learn to have body language that helps express uh, interest that you have. You know what is really bad body language? Can I show you really bad body language? Can someone loan me their phone? Thank you, ma'am. Let's say you are visiting someone's house. Okay? Hi. I'll keep it closed. Uh, you're visiting in someone's house, and it's just the two, four of you, you know, three of you, you and your outreach partner and them, and you're doing this. So how was your week? Did you have a good week? Yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. 
excuse me just a minute. And what was this? That's not, when it's just a friend conversation, can you see if you're in a Bible study how that would be distracting? It's very common in today's society. Thank you, ma'am. It's very common in today's society, but that when you are in a person's house and you are with them and the sole purpose of you getting together is to talk to each other. Now, if we're friends and we're sitting side by side and you're texting, God bless you. But when you're at a person's house and your purpose is just to communicate with them, set your phone aside. If you're a doctor and you need to keep it on or you have some kind of emergency background and you need to keep it, I understand that. Keep it on vibrate. But if not, put it aside just for an hour so you can focus completely on that person that you're looking at and working with. It's hard to do in a technological age. Um, but I think that that helps you focus more on what you're studying. Okay, study time. What do you do in study time? I asked if they had a chance to work on their lesson. Sometimes you give the lesson ahead of time, ask if they worked on it. Have an opening prayer, keep it short. You do not give your sermon an opening prayer. You just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be with you. I have a short introduction to your Bible study. I'll explain how to do that. Present your Bible study. We'll be looking at more at that. Keep it Christ-centered. We'll be looking more at that. Connect personally with them and use a personal testimony. All of these, we're actually going to take about 20 minutes and go through one by one and practice it. So right now, I'm going to continue on to the next one. And that is appeal and decision. Uh, ask this question. How will this study affect their life? So as I'm driving or riding to my Bible study friend's house, I ask myself this question. Today, we're about to study the, let's pick on uh, the 2300 days. We're about to discuss the long time prophecy in Daniel 8.14. And I ask myself this question. How will this study affect their life? If you don't know how it's going to positive, positively affect their life, don't give it. What that means is <laughs> you may need to study a little bit to find out what's so positive about it. What's so positive about the 2300 days? I'm willing to take anyone who wants to answer this one. And there may be several different answers. What's so positive about the 2300 days? I mean, it's one of our major doctrines. Shouldn't we present it? Well, yes. Well, what are you going to... You're in judgment right now, and God's watching you. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? You don't like that? How is it affect? How can I present it positively? What's the positive effect of the 2300 days? Praise God. Amen. More than just an advocate, what else do I have? A coming king and a judge. Amen? I love that. I can't wait to present the judgment. You know why? Because Jesus is my high priest, Jesus is my lawyer, and Jesus is my judge. By the way, you know what that means? He that hath the Son hath life. If you have Jesus Christ, you've got everything. The judgment is hope-filled. Because we know the judge, we know our lawyer, we have a high priest who intercedes on our behalf. It is good news. Now, um, so... I would suggest that before you give a Bible study, whatever the subject is, know how it's going to positively affect their life. Let me give you another one. It's not as easy. Well, that one wasn't easy either. Um, you're about to present the state of the dead. All right? You're about to present what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that when a person dies, they are asleep awaiting the resurrection. How will that positively affect their life? You know, I meet a lot of people who say, when you die, you go straight to heaven. So that means their grandma's in heaven right now. And if you tell them it's different than that, you just took grandma from heaven. <laughs> so how can this positively affect their life? Help me out. You see, the grandma will be sad when she sees her grandchildren suffering. I agree. That's what I say. Is there anyone else who want to say something different? Okay, I think you just spoke for all of us. Because I know my grandma, uh, by God's grace, we will see her again. Okay? Love Jesus. Just love talking about Jesus. But after she died, she had a daughter commit suicide. She had a son go into a mental asylum. She had another daughter go into a mental asylum. She saw marriage breaks up. All would have taken place in our family. How would she have felt? I tell you something, heaven would not have been heaven for her. 
But she doesn't know any of that. For she is asleep in the grave, peacefully waiting for the resurrection. For her, it's just as a second. She closed her eyes, and she will be just waking up just like that. But for us, it's decades of time. She doesn't see it. She is in peace right now. She is waiting. For her, it's just the blink of an eye. So that's hope, isn't it? That's a positive thing to think that your grandma truly has rest. So that is something that I think is important, knowing before you go to the study how it's going to positively affect their life. And when you give the appeal, make sure you show the positiveness. Always ask for a decision. Seal that decision in prayer. Give the next lesson. And then that last phrase, leave right away. I'm going to ask quickly, why should I leave right away? They get, they get bored. And that's, that's a possibility. Let them think about it. You know when, yes. You, that's a good answer from someone from Ohio. Sorry, we had this conversation at lunch. <laughs> I have found that when you ask people to make a decision, you give an appeal, and they make that decision, and you pray over it, the Holy Spirit's in power and working. It's at that time you want to leave so the Holy Spirit is the one that's being heard. If you stay, the conversation may switch back to the most recent football game. Yes? That's what you call soccer here, yeah? Or the most recent rugby game or what's taking place in the, in the world of news. So if you leave while the conviction of the Holy Spirit is still fresh in the heart, then the Holy Spirit can keep working on their heart after you leave. So that's one of the reasons we suggest leave right away and uh, continue on your way. All right. In giving a Bible study, here are some pointers. This is kind of a whole mirage of different things. Um, eye contact is important. Don't imitate, uh, intimidate. Yes, don't intimidate them. Um, I had trouble with eye contact for a long time. Uh, like I said, I was shy, quite shy. And so looking someone in, in the eye is very difficult. You want to look up or look down. But having good eye contact, again, not staring the person down, but having good eye contact makes people feel comfortable like you care about them. Smile. They won't catch your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, you don't want to... Uh, I, I'm just looking forward to this Bible study. Aren't you? Yes. Okay. You know, sometimes we, we feel that way about our Bible study. You need a smile. Now, it's hard. I remember the first time I taught. I'm a, I'm a classroom teacher. I remember the first time I taught. I was so scared. I sat down for two weeks straight. I did not stand for the first two weeks of, myself, of teaching. I sat in my teacher's desk. I taught the lecture sitting down because I was scared. I understand that. So what I suggest, and this is what we do at AFCO, is we actually have people practice before they give their first Bible study. If you... Uh, if you want to, you can practice by looking yourself in the mirror and give yourself a Bible study. If you're like me, I hate looking at myself in the mirror. So what I would do is find a friend and practice with a friend. Practice with your spouse, with a friend. Practice with your children. Yeah. But practice before you go out. And it helps you become more comfortable. Use their name frequently. Everyone likes it when you use their name. And include yourself in the prayer. I've heard prayers like this that are not good. Father in heaven, you know Susie. She doesn't know the truths of your word, and she desperately needs them. Please open up her eyes so she can see what she's doing wrong. <laughs> Amen. We laugh, but you know, there are prayers that are almost sound like that. A better way to do it is include yourself in the prayer. Father in heaven, we are coming here to study your word. Open our eyes and help us to see glimpses of you today. That's, that's, you see, all, all it's us. And we are coming together, and we have to kind of, you know, the reason why we say prayers like that first prayer is because we actually think that we're better than them. What we need to do is realize that we all need Jesus, even the person who's giving the Bible study, and we're coming together as friends to study Jesus together. It's very helpful when you look at it from that perspective. Speak clearly, monotone is not loud, and that's, uh, um, again, that comes with practice. I strongly suggest practicing. Uh, be a good listener. There's, a, some, there's an American president by the name of John F. Kennedy. 
John Accardini was famous for something that many people don't know about, and that is he was a good listener. When you would enter John F. Kennedy's office, when he was the President of the United States, he would put down his papers, stop what he's doing, grab his chair, come around the edge of his desk and sit down, and he would give you 30 minutes, or however long your appointment was with him, of undivided attention. The President of the United States. Amazing. That's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, that's a lot of stress. You and I typically don't have that much stress, although we do have stress in our lives. Let's learn how to give that same kind of attention to those people who we're studying with. Give them our undivided attention for the amount of time that we're with them. Be a good listener. Um, lift up Christ. He is and must be the center of every study. Okay, how is Christ the center of the study on the Antichrist? You're welcome to help me out. I'm, I'm trying to choose hard ones. I could ask you how Christ is the center of the second coming, right? And you could tell me, how is Christ the center of the second coming? He's the one who's coming, right? So that's pretty easy. And we could talk about him coming and what he promises, that it, I will go and prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you unto myself. We could talk about uh, how he promises that when he comes, there'll be angels with him. And he, how he said, you know, every eye is going to see him. That's all Jesus-centered. But how do you make Jesus the center of a message on the Antichrist? I heard it, but I didn't hear it. I'm getting older. I don't hear as well. That's what I say. You have to know Christ before you know the Antichrist. So when you're going through this whole list of all these characteristics, isn't that the classically the way we do it? Here is the 10 identifying marks of the Antichrist. How do, can you make Christ the center of that? Well, if you're finding it hard, I do too. But I strongly suggest that you find out. Let's, here's what a friend of mine shared with me. I, I, did, I asked this question. There was a young boy in the audience. And he said, here's how you do it. I said, okay. And he told me, when you're writing out the character, I haven't done this yet. When you write out the characteristics of the Antichrist, Put the characteristics of Christ in the same time. Instead of his saying blasphemy, what is he? He's the source of all truth. He is the life. Amen? When you look at the fact that he persecutes the saints, what would you say about Jesus? He strengthens the saints and keeps them safe and watches over them. When you look at, um, there's another one. Well, there's ten more, but I mean. When you see who Christ is, lift up Christ. So when you finish your presentation, they're not thinking, okay. Let's see. Let me tell everyone about how bad the Catholic Church is. I met a lot of people. As soon as they finish evangelistic seminar, they hear this truth. This is fantastic. They just want to go and let the whole world know that there's a certain denomination that's really bad. I don't want people to leave my seminar thinking that. I don't want people to leave my Bible study thinking that. So somehow I want them to, to, to see Christ lifted up so when they're done, they're like, whoa, what an awesome God we have. He foresaw this. He knew it was going to happen. And he's provided us everything he's needed. You know what else I could lift up about Christ in the center of the Antichrist? We looked at it this morning. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. And Jesus says, come out of her, my people. Christ's people are in churches that don't know all the truth. You're allowed to say, amen. That's awesome. So these are ways that we can put Christ in the center of messages. Okay. Uh, would you all like to stand up? I know this is kind of un unorthodox, but if you don't mind standing up. And uh, could you find someone that you don't know? Find someone you don't know well and team up with them. Find someone you don't know well and team up with them. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Very quick. I'm going to list four C's. Are you ready? Four number C, letter C's. And these four C's are a summary of what, of what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. So have you ever had someone ask you, what do you Adventists believe anyhow? And you get confused. Oh, well, we don't eat pork. Right? What else can you share? Here's the four C's. Listen carefully, and then I'd like you to share the four C's back and forth between each other to make sure it's stuck in your brain, and then we'll sit down. C number one, we believe in Christ. 
C number two, we believe in his cross. C number three, we believe in his commandments. C number four, we believe in his coming. Oh, that just sounds good, doesn't it? We believe in Christ. We believe in his cross. We believe in his commandments. We believe in his... Okay, happy sharing. So, anyhow. Four C's. We believe in Christ. We believe in his... We believe in his... We believe in his... Beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. What a beautiful thing. So if someone asks you, and a friend asks you, what do you believe? Uh, we don't eat pork and we don't go to nightclubs. No. We believe in Christ. We believe in his... We believe in his... We believe in his... Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, that's a Christ. He must be the center of everything. All right. Be careful of uh, giving studies that simply satisfy unimportant curiosities. Um, and... For example, if someone says, you know, I'm not sure what, uh, I, I want to do a Bible study and find out what tribe of Israel was more important. Was it Nephali or was it uh, uh, Zebulon? I mean, I'm sure it's a great question to ask, but that's really not the most important thing to study in the Bible. Would you agree with me? Thank you. Good. I was getting nervous. I hope I didn't... Uh, Go question by question through the lesson. Ask the question, look up in the Bible text for the answer, even if it's already in the lesson. You know, there are some Bible studies. Uh, Amazing Facts Bible studies are like this. It is Written Bible studies are like this. Discover Bible studies are like this. They actually put the verse in the lesson. So if you don't want to, you don't have to look it up. But I strongly suggest, if you're giving a Bible study with someone, that you actually open up the Bible with them and look at it and answer the questions from the Bible. That way, people get used to turning these pages themselves, and it becomes uh, a textbook for them, something they, they can trust in. Um, take turns reading the Bible text. Ask diagnostic questions. Um, is it clear to you from the Bible that the seventh day is a Sabbath? Does this make sense to you? This is a great question. Is it clear to you from the Bible? And then add whatever you want. Is it clear to you from the Bible that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of the 70 weeks? Amen. Is it clear to you from the Bible that we are living in a time of judgment? It's a good thing. Is it clear to you from the Bible that when Jesus comes, every eye will see him? Is it clear to you from the Bible that the law is a transcript of the character of God? These are all questions that you can ask. You don't say, how do you feel about the seventh day being the Sabbath? We're having a Bible study, not a feeling study. Sorry. Our focus is what the Bible says and not what our emotions say. So we want to direct our friends and our students to what the Bible's saying. And then have confidence in your study. You don't need to apologize for it. I'm not saying be bold and rough. What I'm saying is when you're studying the Word of God, you don't have to apologize for what the Word of God says. God said it. I don't need to apologize for God. If God says it, I believe it. And have that mindset. I think it's very important when we're studying with our friends. When you're giving the Bible study, stay focused. Always bring it back if the person talks too much. Have you ever met a person just, they, they talk and they can take one point and go this direction? Bring it back. Hold it in place. Um, and try to avoid asking, what do you think about the study? I, we just, uh, just discussed that. We want to keep it focused on what the Bible says. Keep our focus on that. Express your appreciation and the pleasure of studying with them. <laughs> Our thought should not be this. Boy, you should be thankful that I'm studying with you. Because I'm a busy person, and I'm taking time out of my schedule to show you about the Bible. We shouldn't have that mindset. What we should have as a mindset is, you know, I am just so glad that you're willing to study the Bible with me. It's been a lot of fun to have a friend and look at the book of Daniel together. Totally different perspective. The next one is know how to salt the oats. Uh, we have an expression in, in uh, the United States that is this. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Right? You've heard it? Yeah, it is true. However, you can salt the oats. What does it mean to salt the oats? If you add salt to the horse's oats, he gets thirsty, and then he drinks. What you want to do as a teacher is add salt to the oats. Let me give you an example. 
I'm just finishing, you're going to find out that one of my favorite studies happens to be the 2300 days in the 70 weeks. I keep talking about it. And I would say something like this. You know, tonight, we have just learned without question that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the only person that came right on time and fulfills all the prophecies of the Bible. He is the Messiah. It's awesome. But you know what? We're going to be learning next week about what he's doing right now. The longest Bible prophecy, the longest time prophecy in the entire Bible is what we're going to be studying next week. I'm looking forward to studying with you. For a lot of people, they would say, ooh, where is that? I want to find out. I try to get their interest so they're interested for next week. So that's what it means to salt the earth. If you've been to an evangelistic seminar, evangelists do this all the time. They'll try to get you excited. You know, the Bible says that when Jesus comes, he's going to come as a thief in the night. Some people tell us that when that happens, one's going to be taken and the other's going to be left. Come back tomorrow night and find out what the Bible teaches about what happens when Jesus comes again. What did I do? Yeah, salt the oats. And that is your, your uh, desire. Okay. Be consistent with your Bible studies. This is crucial. What does it mean, be consistent with your Bible studies? Okay. Let's say you come home from work, and you have your Bible study with your next-door neighbor, and you are tired. And you know, you just want to just relax. You should not call them up and say, let's cancel this week, and let's come next week. As the friend who's initiating the Bible study, you should never cancel unless it's an extreme emergency. They'll cancel on you, and that's their right. They have a right to cancel on you, but you can never cancel on them unless it's an extreme emergency because you want to show um, how important you feel the Bible study is, being consistent with it. Timing your studies before an evangelistic series. Uh, when you have a public series taking place, do you do public series here in Singapore? I heard a yes. Yes? Okay. When you have a public series, What's nice is to start Bible studies with your friends. Now remember, you've been making friends all the time. That's what we do as Adventists, as Christians. We're always making friends because we love people. We suggest Bible studies starting about a month and a half, two months before a seminar begins. When you do that, you get through the first couple lessons with them, and then when the evangelist comes, you can say, there's a, there's a, we've been doing Bible studies together, but there's a friend of mine coming from wherever, and they're giving a live Bible study with interactive PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to it. Would you like to join me? So you would take them from a study in their home to a study together in a public setting. So we find we use this at AFCO in the United States. I love it. Uh, we use it all the time. Don't overprove your subject. 10 to 12 texts are enough. Avoid the spiritual machine gun and never tell all you know on a subject. Uh, keep them wanting more. There are some friends of mine that are like uh, engineers and they're mathematical and they're very intelligent. And what happens is when they present something, they want to make sure they cover it from every single angle so that there's no weakness in it. And so they will give you 100 texts to one Bible study because they want to make sure that they covered every single base. The average unintelligent person like me doesn't need that. What we need is give me 10 to 12 texts Explain it clear enough. If I have questions, I'll ask. But if you give too much information, you know what happens? The common people go to sleep. Um, I, I have met that there are, <laughs> I actually have relatives that are very um, intelligent. My, uh, my wife's dad is very intelligent. And he can come from so many different perspectives that he's a person who could benefit from someone giving a lot of information. But a lot of us, we benefit from a shorter explanation. So keep that in mind. If you don't give everything you know, it's always good because then if someone asks you questions, you can answer. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, what happens if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? <laughs> Make up an answer. Right? <laughs> well, it says in the third book of opinions that we're not supposed to do that. Have you heard of the third book of opinions? We are, okay, sorry. Um, what happens when people ask you a question you don't know the answer to? Very simple. Say, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. I don't know the answer, but I, this week I will study it more. Or you can say, why don't we both study this question? And uh, we'll share what we learn next week. Admitting that you don't know all the answers actually makes you more trustworthy. 
Because if anyone knows all the answers or thinks that they know all the answers, everyone knows that they really don't know all the answers and then you don't trust them. But if you admit that you don't know all the answers, people trust you more. Okay. What happens if they ask me a question that we'll cover in a future lesson? Um, I told you I was going to tell you a, a story that's negative. Can I tell you a story that's negative? I don't, I don't like doing this, but I'm going to tell you this just to show you what not to do. Okay? My wife doesn't always like when I do this. We were holding an evangelistic seminar in the beautiful state of Pennsylvania. And um, there was a family that came. They sat in the front row, lined up, a mother, two daughters, and a husband. And after the first night, they said, thank you, Chuck. We appreciated it. After the next night, they came back. And after I finished talking, mother came up to me. She said, I've got some problems with you. I said, really? She goes, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I am. Now, we were actually holding a seminar in a Seventh-day Adventist church. So it, was, it, was pretty, uh, it was pretty open. We weren't trying to hide anything. And she said, okay, well, you believe that when a person dies, they sleep. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Now, what should I have done? I said, I'm great. I'm glad you asked. It's very important that I can see you're interested in studying the Bible. But... We have a subject coming on that soon. It's better for us to cover some of these foundational subjects first. I don't want to ruin for you. A five-minute answer won't be enough. I promise, let's wait until the subject. I promise it'll be worth the wait. That's what I should have done. But you know what I did? I was foolish, and I argued with her. Now, I know my Bible. I'm, I'm trying to sound cocky right now. Is it okay? I know my Bible. Come on. And so I gave it to her. Bam, 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 bam. She goes, and you believe in the 70 weeks. You are you're people who believe that the, the 70th week is connected to the 69th week. I said, absolutely. And you don't? Ooh. Give it to her again. Two hours. I can't believe it. She came back the next night. And she came with her family again. And this time we got into a discussion. She had, the, she had the audacity to say, and you had your whole church founded on some prophet named Ellen White. Oh, man. I gave it to her. Told her where she was wrong. And I did it too. I won battle after battle with her. But why? That's not Christ's method, is it? It's not his method. Her daughter spoke up and said, I see where you're coming from. And she actually agreed with me. That was the worst thing that could have ever happened. Because that mother was not going to let her daughter keep coming if she agreed with me. So she kept, and her, and her family never came back. Well, we went to visit at her house. And you think I would learn by now, right? I went to visit with the pastor. I'm in my mid-30s at that point, and the pastor in his early 20s. And I was thinking as I was going there, I'm going to show him a thing or two about visitation. He's a young guy, just got out of the seminary. I've been doing this for a while, you know? So we go into the house, and we said hi to them. And that mama, she just can't resist. She went and hit me. Bam! Not physically, okay, but spiritually. Man, let me just hit you with this. And you know what I did? I hit back. Pulled out my Bible and bam, 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 bam. And we were going at it back and forth. After about 15, 20 minutes, the pastor, the young guy who doesn't know anything, speaking tongue-in-cheek, he said, uh, excuse me, and we both stopped because he hadn't spoken yet. And we listened to him. He said, uh, haven't we forgotten something? What? Shouldn't we pray first? We were quiet. We obviously let him pray because we weren't probably in the right mode at that time. And when he finished praying, I kept my mouth shut because I found someone who knew how to visit better than I did. Amazing. Do you know what the first thing he did is? So, how are you doing? How's your family? I know that you've been struggling with this health issue. How's it going with you? What was he doing? He cared about their needs and ministered to their needs. You know, I believe that there's a possibility she might have stayed longer and maybe even made a decision if I had not acted the way I did. Be careful. When you're visiting, our job is not to beat people over the head with, a, with, with all the knowledge we have. I know how to do it. I've done it. That isn't God's way. Learn from my mistake. Is that okay if I say it? 
learn from that and share with them in a, what their needs are, minister to their needs. And you'll see incredible things take place. All right. What should be included in any study? You know, it's time for us to take a break. Can we take a short break?